can clearly remember the moment it happened. The moment when I realized that climate change is real. It's happening right now, and there's no way of getting out of it. This moment was the beginning of my climate grief. It was 2003, and I was preparing a lecture on the topic of climate change for my Introduction to Environmental Science class. The image that got to me was a graph from the scientific literature projecting sea level rise to the year 2030. My initial thought was, there's no way that this can really happen. Can sea level rise that much and that fast? And yet here we are today. The answer to my questions was a resounding yes. This, these images were taken in August 2020 to show the disappearance of sea ice over the Arctic Circle over the past few decades, and also the open water vista that is now the norm for that region. Sea levels rise in part when polar ice caps melt. This past July 2020 is in a dead heat with July 2016 as the second hottest month ever recorded on the planet. Despite our necessary distraction right now with the global pandemic and a heap of societal problems, climate change has continued on, unmitigated, unstoppable in the background. Sea level change from the melting poles isn't the only blatant sign of climate change. We witnessed vast regions of Australia and more recently California burn this year, along with billions of animals and hundreds of properties. Mountain glaciers are disappearing, hurricanes are strengthening, pine beetles are spreading, ice sheets are melting. And it's all happening very, very fast, especially when we consider that climate change is on a planetary scale. In the Western world, we most often hear about solutions and strategies for dealing with climate change that revolve around how we use energy. What energy sources should we develop and expand to replace fossil fuels? What types of transportation can we use that are more sustainable? We also talk about changing our consumption patterns, like ending single-use plastics, eating locally grown foods, and in many locations, conserving fresh water supplies. Now, these are all great solutions, but there is another solution that we don't hear about as often. And that solution is all around us, even inside of us, and is responsible for supporting all life on our planet. What I'm referring to is the microbial world. Microorganisms are the original life forms that occupied our planet, and they evolved to cycle and recycle all of the nutrients that support every other life form, including us. In discussing climate change, it's the microorganisms that control a large chunk of greenhouse gas emissions because they are the gatekeepers for production and consumption of greenhouse gases. And we can work with them to change the equation from greenhouse gas production to its consumption. We humans don't often consider how our day-to-day -day choices could influence the invisible microbial world and something as big as climate change. So let me give you an example of how our behaviors can influence greenhouse gas production by microorganisms. Let's take the example of methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas that is about 20 to 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide and holding in heat. Today, methane accounts for about 28% of global warming, and human activities are responsible for about half of the methane that reaches the atmosphere. Now suppose you come home one night and you just don't want to cook dinner, so you order in your favorite meal, beef curry. Now, as an aside, I'm only using beef curry as an example of a food choice with a strong methane footprint. I'm not attempting to advocate or persuade anyone to change their food choices. But if this example convinces you to choose foods with a smaller methane footprint, then more power to you. Now, each part of this meal has a substantial methane footprint that contributes to annual methane emissions to the atmosphere. First, the rice. Rice has grown in paddy fields, that are flooded for much of the year. These nutrient and carbon rich soils are also depleted in oxygen. When the oxygen is gone, a certain type of microbe is in the perfect habitat to grow and churn out large quantities of methane. We call these microbes methanogens because they literally generate methane. Globally, rice paddies are responsible for about 15 to 20% of human caused methane emissions. 
Now let's look at the beef. The cow stomach, or the rumen, is a microbial soup that is loaded with methanogens, the same microbes that are found in rice patties. When a cow eats grass, the carbon-rich, oxygen-depleted environment of the rumen promotes methane production. As the cow regurgitates its cud, which is part of the process for how cows digest grass, the gas emitted in burps is highly enriched in methane from the gas produced in the rumen. Rumen gas can also exit the back end of the cow, but most of the methane is actually from the front end. Once you've consumed the rice and curry, the plastic dish is thrown into the garbage. Unfortunately, even with the best recycling programs, the majority of the plastic we throw away in North America is still going to landfill. Once in the landfill, the plastic is buried. Once again, the carbon-rich, oxygen-depleted soil promotes methanogens to do their thing, and landfills are another major source of methane. The last part of the methane footprint for our beef curry meal is the manufacture of the plastic dish itself. Plastics are mostly made from fossil fuel sources. Industries that use fossil fuels for manufacturing can also release methane, and we see this in the form of flare stacks. The flame on top of flare stacks is from burning excess methane that is too low in concentration to use directly as a fuel, but too much to release directly into the atmosphere. So industries take care of this excess methane by flaring. This example shows how our choices and social practices encourage the production of a greenhouse gas, mostly by changing the behavior of microorganisms. We are providing the best environments that encourage methanogens to grow and generate methane. But microbes are amazing in that they always balance their activities. Methane that's made by one group of microbes is consumed by another group of microbes. This is the definition of a cycle production, followed by its consumption, followed by its production, and so on. This animation shows how methane-consuming bacteria use methane as a sole carbon and energy source to grow and divide. As more methane is consumed, more bacteria grow and produce more of themselves. We call this collection of growing bacteria biomass. We can capture this activity and resulting biomass in vessels that we call bioreactors. Although bioreactors in the lab space are typically 5 to 10 liters in volume, they can be quite large at the commercial scale in the thousands of liters of capacity. The imbalance we've caused in the methane cycle, and the reason methane is now accumulating in the atmosphere, comes from altering the natural environment of the microbes and pushing them more towards methane production and less towards its consumption. But we can alter that balance and move the methane cycle back towards consumption. In my research group, we are using these methane-eating bacteria to create an industry where we can remove excess methane before it reaches the atmosphere and also generate valuable products that benefit society. We call this new industry methane bioconversions. And the idea is to capture excess methane from industries before it's flared. This can be done by piping the methane into our bioreactors instead of up the flare stacks, or we can capture methane from places where methanogens are active, like sewage sludge or landfill soil. The methane-eating microbes in our bioreactors consume the methane and generate biomass. This biomass is then the source material for creating valuable products like liquid biofuels, single-cell protein, which earned that name because the protein is the bacteria themselves, and biopolymers like truly biodegradable plastics. All of these products are being created right now by research teams and companies that have committed to methane bioconversions. I've been very fortunate because my colleagues around the world who isolated methane-eating microbes from all kinds of environments have entrusted them to my care. The goal of my research team is to use the rich metabolic diversity in this collection of methane eaters to find new types of products and also to optimize their ability to consume tons of methane and produce tons of products annually. Bioconversion of excess methane from industry is only one type of technology that can reverse the cycle from net greenhouse gas production to its consumption. There are many other types of microorganisms, cycles, and processes that can be manipulated with technological innovation 
and move us closer to sustainability in the face of climate change. For instance, we can use microbes to fertilize plants instead of adding chemical fertilizers. The reduction in chemical fertilizer use is a significant way we can prevent the release of large quantities of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere on a global scale. We can use microbes to make truly biodegradable plastics on one hand, but we can also use microbes to degrade the persistent plastic rafts floating around the world's oceans. Microbes can be used to mine metals from landfills that can then be used to manufacture all kinds of materials, even electric car batteries. The world of microorganisms and their potential to alleviate the negative consequences of climate change is nearly limitless. All it takes is an appreciation and understanding of our microbial world and our desire to work with it. Maybe your moment of climate grief was unrelated to rising sea levels. Maybe your moment was breathing in smoke-filled air from runaway wildfires, or the disappearance of your favorite glacier or butterfly species. Or maybe you haven't yet had that moment of stark realization that climate change is real and we're experiencing its consequences right now. Once I awakened to the climate emergency, I decided to use my scientific training to help solve the problem. In my years as a microbiologist, I have found that the world's smallest and most abundant life forms do indeed hold big and achievable solutions. <laughs>